So the next person that is going to speak will come to us via Zoom, Ralph Jerome. So usually when I'm in a room, because I worked for 25 years with Mars, I get to say, nobody knows more about chocolate than I do, and I'm telling you, this chocolate's good. But in this case, um, nobody knows more in this room about chocolate than Ralph Jerome. Um, Ralph worked for 30 plus years with Mars Incorporated. And for many of those years, it was actually in the chocolate, um, the global chocolate business. And in fact, Ralph ended up leading the R&D um, division for Mars Incorporated. So he was the global uh, chocolate R&D vice, vice president. And Ralph is, he's got a master's degree and also a bachelor's degree in food science from Rutgers University. Um, and I have never, Ralph is the single best innovation leader that I have ever met in the food industry um, in terms of being able to span science and technology breakthroughs and then think about what that means in terms of creating new products that not just a few people will like, but a lot of people will like. Um, and how are we doing on getting Ralph up there? All right, good. Um, and then I <laughs> just wanted to make sure if I should, you know, string this introduction out a little bit longer or not. But no, nope, there he is. Good. So, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll conclude the intro by saying, um, in addition to being, I think, the best innovation leader I've, I've ever met in the food industry, nobody has thought more about um, creating a new category, a paradigm shift or a paradox shift. Um, I was thinking about that too while Scott was talking in terms of healthy um, snacking. Um, Ralph has spent literally decades thinking about this, doing this, creating um, creating new foods in this category. And, um, and Ralph is going to uh, take us through through um, you know a key part of the trifecta, which is taste, and I'll turn it over to him now. So thank you, Ralph, for being able to be with us. Hi, hi everybody. So today uh, I'm going to talk about cracking the code on the flavor of Chardonnay Mark. But you've heard the word trifecta quite a bit. And I just want to define what we mean by trifecta. And it's uh, when three elements come together in, in a successful or noteworthy way. And in this case, we've talked about taste, health, and sustainability. But ultimately, flavor wins by a nose. And notice I said flavor, and I didn't say taste. And I'm going to just go into that for a second. Can I have the next slide? And the reason for that is that flavor uh, includes a number of things. One of those is, is taste. So flavor is aroma, it's taste, and it's chemosensory stimuli. Now, just think about when you have a cold, a really bad cold, and you can't really breathe through your nose. We always say, oh, I really can't taste that much. You know, you could probably taste sweet and sour, but you really don't get the richness of the food. Or maybe when you had COVID, you didn't, you didn't taste as much. You didn't get the aroma. So there's an aromatic or a, a volatile component of flavor that we talk about. Then there's taste, and that's really on, on the tongue. And you've got sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. Umami is that savory note that we, we love in things like, um, you know, brothy foods and uh, Chinese food that, you know, is really well prepared. Um, and then there's chemosensory. And that's really uh, touch sensors, heat sensors, spiciness. The, when we talk about dryness on the mouth, these are the, the, the sensations that you get that all those three things combined are what we mean as flavor. Now, one of the things, and I'm sure many of you have tried Vine de Bar chocolate, but there's also this temporal aspect of flavor, how the flavor is released in your mouth. And, you know, when you have a really good dark chocolate, you get these fruity and fragrant notes up front you know, that, that we really like. And sometimes when it's a really dark chocolate, you also get some significant bitterness at the end. 
So you see how you get the upfront taste and then it, over time, that's what they mean by temporal, uh, that you get this change and this aftertaste. One of the beauties of the Vine de Bar chocolate is that with the Chardonnay mark, you're getting all those fruity floral notes up front. There's a significant tea note in there that is part of the body of the flavor through the whole eat. And then at the end, this sourness comes out and it's, it's a very pleasant acidic note that sort of masks some of the bitterness at the end. So you've got this, this effect. And in addition to that, when we put a little salt on the chocolate and you've got to try the chocolate coated almonds with the uh, sea salt on them, that salt is super enhanced by the Chardonnay mark. You get this wonderful umami note as well. So, Today, we're going to cover some work that is done by John Manafo in his fantastic lab at the University of Tennessee, and it's going to get into some flavor analysis. So with the flavor analysis, you've got, we're going to talk about quantifying and understanding what some of those aromatics are. So remember how important they were. We really want to understand and crack the code on what those aromatics are. And we're in the process of cracking the code on what some of those taste and are. We're going to talk a little bit about the techniques that John uses, and we're going to talk about the implication of what makes these wonderful flavors and taste and aromas in this wonderful product. So the work I mentioned is done at the University of Tennessee. Harold mentioned um, the Journal of Agriculture and Food Chemistry. A lot of the work has already been published in three three publications, peer-reviewed. So this is top-notch science. Can I have the next slide? John is, is a globally recognized flavor and natural products chemist, and he's an incredible colleague. I've known John for, gee, I bet you 20 years, and he's, he's an amazing collaborator, and he does outstanding work, and the, he works well and, and with his team. John's on the, on the bottom under the T. Uh, that's John Monopo, and those are some of the folks in his lab. So why is the flavor of Chardonnay Mark so good? And, and we're, we're starting to understand that, and we're going to go into that now, okay? So it starts with genes, good genetics. Uh, Scott was talking about the Chardonnay grape. It's an amazing grape. Chardonnay is loved, uh, is the most loved uh, wine in the United States. It's uh, more Chardonnay is made than anything else. The U.S., and, and the grapes have been, the, the Chardonnay grape has been cultivated since the Middle Ages. So it, it goes way back. So there's a great genetic heritage to, to these, this, this grape to begin with. And then there's cultivation. So you've heard cool coastal Chardonnay a number of times. And Scott, Scott mentioned that. And Harold mentioned that. It means the grapes ripen slowly and they develop complex flavors during that ripening. And while they're doing that, they retain a good acidity. And I mentioned that that acidity is really important in the way this product performs in, in, in food products. And you're going to, the lunch is going to be amazing because you're going to have it in everything and you'll see how it complements things. In some cases, it brings out uh, other flavors. In some cases, it, it um, masks things. And in some cases, it just has a wonderful flavor on its own. So then there's harvesting and harvesting, is, you know, timing the harvest along with proper handling, help maintain cluster integrity, reduce damage and minimize farm materials or what we call MOG, materials other than grapes. So all of these things have been learned throughout the process. And Scott said this goes back a while. All of these steps have been taken to understand what what absolutely makes the best the best uh, Chardonnay mark. And then there's also mod removal. So you have the clusters, you have these beautiful grapes, and then there's more more quality control, removing leaves, rocks, sticks, you know, just different things that would uh, be in any agricultural raw material. But these are removed, and they're removed um, to, to the benefit of the wine as as well, and ultimately to the benefit of the Chardonnay more. And then this is what's in the press. I, this is a, a shot of a, a press and in, inside the press. And you see, look at this stuff. I mean, it's beautiful. All that good work, the great genes, the great handling. And they end up with these clusters in the press. 
and then we press it. And the wine goes off to make the wonderful Chardonnay that uh, everybody loves. But look what's left. All those genetics, those genes are still there. All those, a lot of those complex flavor compounds, they're still there. All the, a lot of those aromatics, they're still there. Uh, all the good, uh, healthy oligosaccharides are there. So this is, and look at it. It looks beautiful. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful food. So that's what's coming out of the press. And then we need to start to turn it, turn that press, those pressings into the Chardonnay mark that we use in, in our food products. So the first thing we do is we destem it. So we remove the stems that were on the clusters, right? And then we freeze it. And this, uh, this is an important step because what we want to do is we want to stop any potential fermentation. We want to, this is important for microbial control and, um, for ultimate quality because once it starts to ferment, as Scott mentioned, we don't want fermentation in these Chardonnay grapes. We want to keep the crispness and the flavors that are present. So controlling that after press material is, is really critical. And the team has done an amazing job at understanding that and, 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 and taking care of that right away at the winery. So, and then it's been stabilized, it's frozen and it's stored, right? Until we're ready to dry it. And this drying step is really important because this has, in each one of these steps I, I mentioned, we have an impact on flavor. If you have the wrong grapes, the wrong genetics, you don't get great flavor. If you don't cultivate it, and, and we are blessed with coastal, cool coastal Chardonnay, so we get great complexity and, and great acidity. Um, if you don't handle it and, and uh, treat it well, you're going to have mog and things like that. They're going to have negative impacts down the road. And if you don't dry it right, and you know that's a stabilization spot, pot, spot you're going to get burnt flavors or you're going to get um, uh, notes that you really don't desire. So there's a lot of flavor development, good and bad, in the drying, in the drying uh, step. And um, in addition to that, in addition to the drying, this is a key spot in our process to reduce any potential pathogens or micro uh, issues that have come along the way. So we need to we need to have what we call a kill step. So killing any any pathogens. Um, I think it's interesting too. I, I think that you know this is uh, a place where we try to control flavor in that we don't want to overprocess. But we've also noticed we've done that. We have overprocessed it occasionally, and sometimes we produce some interesting notes. So there's an opportunity. This is a this could be also a flavoring step as well. And there it is. There's the Chardonnay mark, uh, start of the show. Um, uh, doesn't look like much there, but we're going to talk a little bit more about it. So can I have the next slide? So this is the next step. So we take that Chardonnay mark and we mill it. And this is also important from a, a sensory perspective as well as, um, uh, a, a, well, a sensory perspective. Because by controlling particle size, we get, uh, we can control texture, right? So when, when we talk about the chocolate, the vine to bar chocolate, we uh, mill the Chardonnay mark, but then it gets milled further so that we're at a, about 20 microns. And I know Valerie is, is there today from Barry Calibo and v Valerie has really been, uh, the, the, you know, built this chocolate from scratch and did a brilliant job. And uh, you'll, you'll be able to talk to Valerie later, but it's an amazing job that, that, that she's done. So after milling, it looks like this. It's a fine powder. And depending on, depending on the application, we'll mill it more or less. So if it's going to go into a capsule, you know, the particle size is not super critical. Um, but if we're going to go into a, a, a food, we really are very careful about how we, we mill it. And it's not only the particle size, it's also the particle size distribution. So in other words, if you have a distribution where the mean of the particle size is, let's say, 30 or 40 micron, um, and let's say what, what's 40 micron, 40 micron would be like confectioner sugar. You know, the, the confectioner sugar that you use, uh, when you're baking or you're dusting stuff. That's about 40 micron. 400 micron would be what granulated sugar would be. So say we get it down to 40 micron. But if you have a bunch of stuff that's at 400 micron and a bunch of stuff at say 
10 micron and it averages out to be okay, that's not good. <laughs> you know, cause you're still going to get that chunky stuff and you're going to get stuff that's so, so fine. It gets kind of dry and clunky in your mouth. So you need this nice distribution. So we're really careful about the way, the way we mill. Okay. This is an important one as we get into the flavor section. We talk about the great work from the Monopo lab. The, the Chardonnay mark is 60% skins. It's 35% seeds and it's 5% stems. And we're going to talk about some of the aromatic compounds, the volatiles, the, the things that we talked about earlier, uh, and how they contribute to the overall flavor of the Chardonnay mark. But remember, 60% skins, so skins are the dominant material here, then there's seeds. And one of the things that uh, to note is that these three things have different flavor elements. Um, some of them overlap significantly. Some of them are unique to the individual component. But the important thing is that there's an opportunity there. Depending on the flavor profile we want, we can manipulate these things. We can add more seeds or less seeds or whatever. What is Chardonnay Mark Aroma? And I'm going to talk about aroma now, okay? Uh, it's bright, balanced, it's fruity and floral with subtle notes of cooked apple and caramel with a background of tea, a pleasant tea-like note that blends beautifully into the chocolate and, and a, a fatty notes that may be compared to something like a, like, let's say a baked fat, like, uh, say a croissant. And this is the magic well, it's really brilliant science and the basis of the three publications that John's lab has, has done. I'm going to simplify this a little bit because it's pretty, pretty technical, but it's important to understand how thorough this is. I, I hope you can get out of this, how this can be applied for us to make better products going forward because of cracking the code. So let me go through these steps and I hope you can see that chart. Uh, so first, the, the, the aroma compounds are extracted. Next, they are isolated and the volatiles are isolated through a method called solvent assisted flavor evaporation or SAFE. Think of it as a distillation, a very gentle distillation under vacuum so that these very uh, volatile compounds can be lifted out of the liquid they're in and condensed and captured, right? So now John's team has isolated these special compounds that create the aroma of Chardonnay Mar. Now, they're all in that liquid, but we need to identify them. And they use some really amazing techniques to separate, identify the aroma through a sniffing port, and then use GC mass spec to identify what the specific compounds are. So that's the identification piece. So we've extracted the aroma compounds, We've isolated the aroma compounds. Then we've identified what they are. But that's not the whole story because you have to quantify what's there. So then there's a quantification that's done. And this is done via a very scientifically difficult uh, set of words, but I'm just going to say it because it's cool. It's done by stable isotope dil dilution assays. And what, what the team team is doing is, is really identifying the amount of the aroma compound that's present. So now they can start to say, okay, I know the amount and I have an idea of the threshold of the, that flavor. I have to understand now what is the impact? What's the importance of that, that compound in, in the overall flavor? And that's what John's team does. And that's the impact estimate. And that's called an odor activity value is assigned, and that's done by uh, dividing the concentration of the, the compound that's present divided by the level or the threshold level, this, the smallest amount that can be present till you get the aroma, right? So that's called the OAV or the odor activity value. So now we know from this material, and John's team identifies what are the top odor activity values for these different compounds. So they know the compound, they know the impact of the compound, and they say, okay, and they know the concentration, right? So they can then build what's the, 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 a really important point here is the aroma model. And uh, so they basically assemble the, the, the aroma from all the constituents that they know that they think are important. They then take that aroma model 
and then compare it to the aroma of the Chardonnay Mark itself. And they use a trained sensory panel to do this. So they make up the cocktail of what they think's there. They then use a trained panel to, to smell that. And then they take the Chardonnay Mark and they do the same. They put it in into a solution. And then the sensory panel smells that. And they do a comparison to see, did this aroma model simulate closely the aroma of the Chardonnay Mark? If it does, then we understand the aroma compounds that are present. And it's pretty amazing, right? I mean, basically dissecting the flavor and putting it back together and then comparing it to the original um, original piece. Can I have the next slide? So let me give you a couple of examples. This is um, one of the compounds that's important. It's called beta ionone. And it has an odor threshold, so the lowest amount that you can, uh, where it first is detectable. It's got an uh, odor threshold of 0 0.021, right? And in, it is present in the product, in the Chardonnay mark, at 62 parts per billion, right? So, in other words, that's got a pretty strong impact on, on the flavor. We know beta ionone is important, and that has an aroma of floral or violet. This one is called linalu. It's got a floral and citrus note, and it is present at uh, 36 parts per billion. Now, it's not just the compound being present, and this is what John is trying to communicate here, is that when the, the way the molecule is assembled also has an impact. So if you look on the right, you'll see that there's um, a different level of odor threshold. So remember, it's present at 36 parts per billion, but depending on the configuration, it's going to either have 0.8 parts per billion for a flavor threshold or aroma threshold or 7.4 parts per billion of flavor threshold. In both cases, it's going to have an impact. But in one case, it's got uh, an impact that's 10 times greater than the other one. I think that, that that's pretty cool. So even deciphering what we call the stereochemistry is in, important here. But in both cases, uh, that impact is, is present and it gives a floral citrus note. So this is where it really gets super important because what's done, and remember, is they assemble the, the aroma model, right? You can see here, and this is skins, right? So the first thing I want to point out here is you see the dotted lines? The dotted line is the aroma model. And the dark line is the actual mark. And you can see the precision and how brilliant this team is because that they map over each other. So that tells us that we know what the aroma compounds are in the skins. This is skins, right? So this is 60% of the product. Look how close they got. And what you, you see here, the dominant things are going to be that fruity, fruity notes, the tea, and this grainy, roasty kind of note. Again, you can see the dotted lines and you can see the solid lines. The solid lines are the original product, the seeds. The uh, dotted line is the aroma model and they're, they're like spot on. Look how close they are. And again, um, this accuracy is, is to me, it's incredible. But look what the seeds are bringing. They're bringing something different. They've got the tea notes, which are common in agri dried agricultural materials. So that's not hugely uh, significant, I don't think. It actually blends really nicely in food and, and things like that. It's pleasant. But you note this, the fatty notes, the um, and, and that, that's um, a really a different contribution that's coming from the seeds, and that's not surprising because the seeds have a significant amount of fat uh, in them, and that's giving this uh, nice baked kind of fatty fatty notes. And this is, this is the stems. And remember, the stems are only in there at 5%, and they're not really contributing that much um, to the overall flavor in a unique way. And if we look at the next chart, you can see that um, the stems aren't really bringing that much. This is the three overlaid with each other. The dominant ones the, uh, is, is really the, 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 the skins. And you're getting some uniqueness from the seeds as well. But... Um, in summary, the aroma models match the actual aroma very closely. Uh, therefore, we know the specific molecules that make up the aroma of Chardonnay Mark. 
uh, and skins are providing the fruity floral and tea flavors, while the seeds provide some of the fatty notes. That uh, and the stems are at five percent aren't really contributing all that much, at, at least in the aroma section. Remember, there's the the taste aspects that we're going to talk a little bit about yet later. So this one we're going to you're going to be tested on before you leave. Um, these are the compounds. So th this is cool though. They, they they I have identified the main compounds that deliver the wonderful flavor that we get from Chardonnay, Mark. So that gives us the ability to understand if they're there or not when we when we process, how we can amplify the ones we want, how we can minimize the ones we don't want. And under each one of those compounds, there's uh, uh, an aroma descriptor. So there's tea and then there's floral and fruity and, and things like that. So John's team is using similar techniques to understand the taste sensations of the Chardonnay Mar. What we know now is that uh, the mark is mildly sweet with a pleasant velvety astringency, a sourness, which is uh, coming from the organic acids. There's phenolics and glycosides, which provide some astringency. Um, and we're also noticing that the mark seems to be able to enhance other flavors and, um, and suppress other, other notes. So, uh, Scott mentioned the patent of, that has been assigned to us, and we've noticed that that the Chardonnay mark has this effect that um, that it, it seems to offset some of the bitterness, specifically the bitterness that comes or the astringency that comes from something like cocoa flavanols, which are uh, very desirable from a health perspective, but are not particularly desirable from a taste perspective. And vine to bar chocolate has 200 milligrams of cocoa flavanols in every serving. And one of the reasons why it tastes so good, even though it has 200 migs, and you're not going to find a lot of chocolates out there with 200 migs of cocoa flavanols in it. So when they say dark chocolate's good for you, and they're talking about flavanols, if you don't know the flavanol content, there, there might be none. <laughs> but uh, cocoa, um, vine de bar chocolate has 200 migs of cocoa flavanols, which is enough to make a health claim all throughout Europe, and it's pending a health claim in the United States. So why aren't there more chocolates with high levels of cocoa flavanols in it? Well, one is that they don't taste great, and the Chardonnay mark seems to offset that because nobody's complaining about the taste of our chocolate. Actually, as Scott mentioned, our feedback is uh, five-star 95% uh, of the time. So what what are some of the tastings? And remember, I'm talking about the tongue, right? And this is work that John's team is doing now. They're, they apply a lot of the same techniques, um, but the difference is that, in, in a simple way of explaining it, is that while the aroma molecules are volatile and aromatic and you're getting them through the nasal cavity and you're getting those senses there, the tastings are, are non-volatile. So there, you're noticing those on the tongue, right? So he uses uh, a technique called HPLC, and then he applies a lot of the same techniques then to understand what are the important tastings. And what he's finding out is that there's sugars and amino acids that are providing some sweetness. There's organic acids that are providing the sourness. There's flavanols that are providing some astringency and bitterness. There's ions sodium, potassium, and peptides that are creating some of that saltiness, the, some of the salty flavor. There's amino acids and peptides, and this is really exciting because this is what's creating the umami notes. And then there's flavonoids and glycosides, which are pr producing that, that velvety, that velvety flavor. So let me, let me talk about some takeaways, um, when we can leave this chart up. So some of the takeaways is Chardonnay Mark, has a complex and delightful flavor due to the richness of the aromatics, the taste molecules the, and the tongue, and then the chemosensory stimuli. So some of that velvetiness is, is from that. So it's it's really complex because it's, it's delivering on all three of those things. Um, it, it imparts not only flavor, but it enhances the flavors that it's paired with. And, and Ed and, and Tori are going to take you through a tasting later, and you're going to really get to experience 
the taste of the chocolate and how it's in, enhanced. And in addition, having your entire lunch made with Chardonnay Mark in every product, you're going to be able to tell um, some some of those benefits. And I think Chef Gerard has made some products uh, with the Chardonnay Mark, and he's probably in the panel will be able to describe some of the benefits and the surprises of some of those pairings and combinations. Um, and I just one one um, uh, brief uh, uh, advertisement. Anything with Chardonnay Mark and salt, and any of the chocolate products with a little bit of salt, it, it just it, it's awesome. So enjoy that. Um, and th another takeaway is that the results that we're getting are not an accident. They're a function of great genetics, mindful cultivation, and intelligent processing. And from an innovation perspective, there are a lot of levers to pull here, a ton of levers. And a few examples are, you know, changing the timing of the harvest, uh, changing the varietal, uh, changing the processing condition. We can change the processing conditions. You know, we I showed you that we dried the uh, material uh, as as particulate mat matter after it was frozen. We could do it differently. We could pasteurize. We could liquefy and pasteurize it and dry it different ways. There's a ton of different potential processing techniques that we can use. And very simply, we could change the ratio. You saw the impact of the skins. You saw the impact of the seeds, and you saw the impact of the stems. Changing the balance, the ratio, you can get different flavors. You can also get different health impacts. Probably most, a lot of the oligosaccharides are in the, are in the seeds. Um, a lot of the phenolics are probably in, in the skins. And depending on what you want to optimize, flavor, uh, health, um, you, you can do that and, and mix and match. So that's pretty much what I had to say. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs>